welcome to the drug delivery panel discussion at the 7th International Symposium on Focused Ultrasound. Hi, my name is Christy Holland, and I'll be moderating this session. We will be hearing presentations from the following panelists. Rog Aram, Costas Arvanitis, Tyrone Porter, Ashish Ranjan, and Mikhail Shapiro. They will be speaking on a variety of topics ranging from drug delivery in the brain to treating cancer. His targets highlight the tremendous potential of ultrasound-mediated drug delivery. Following these presentations, we'll have a live panel discussion with the presenters. Please be sure to enter your questions in the chat line. Thanks for joining us in the session and the presentations will begin in just a moment. I would like to thank the Focus of the Sun Foundation for the opportunity to highlight our work in this year's symposium and talk about how Focus Ultrasound can be used to overcome the biological barriers to drug delivery in brain tumors. Let me first say a few things about brain tumors, which uh, epidemiologically brain tumors are among the most aggressive uh, brain malignancies and extremely, with extremely high mortality rates. This is partially due to Current drug delivery systems and approaches against brain tumors are characterized by at least one of the following. They either show poor penetration across the broad brain barrier, which broad brain barrier is used to collectively describe the brain capillaries and their ability to regulate transport of the blood to the brain parenchyma. They also characterize by uh, low interstitial transport and uh, non-specific and limited cellular uptake. Clearly, there is a requirement to concurrently surpass all these rate limited factors, which have consistently been demonstrated to limit clinically effective drug delivery against primary brain tumors and as well as metastatic brain tumors. And therefore, this underscores the need, this challenge underscores the need uh, to develop more robust drug delivery strategies. We believe that uh, transcranial focus ultrasound uh, using physical, uh, which is a physical technology to deposit thermal and mechanical energy deep into the brain can be used to provide such robust strategies. As I will briefly discuss, FDS mediated thermal or mechanical stress, which is mechanical stress is primarily mediated by microbubble oscillations in the brain musculature, can provide, as I, as I mentioned, uh, unique opportunities for developing drug delivery strategies. Let me first talk about the microbubble mediated uh, mechanical stress or how this can be used on this term like microbubble and fast focus ultrasound. I'd like to start from our recent investigation in breast brain metastasis, where after the application of focus ultrasound burst, bursts in combination with intravenous administration of microbubbles, uh, we observe a, a significant increase in transvascular transport, and this has been well documented by other uh, scientists. However, what we also observed was a significant increase in the interstitial transport in the chemo microenvironment. In fact, quantitative analysis using intravital microscopy and mathematical modeling revealed the transition from diffusive to convective transport in the brain tumor microenvironment. We believe that this, has, this can have profound implications for the delivery of large molecular therapeutics, including nanoparticles, where their delivery in brain tumors is currently limited by the diffusive dominated transport that characterizes the brain tumor microenvironment. Interestingly, we also observe that microbubble enhanced focus ultrasound increases the endothelial transmembrane transport, as you can see here from this plot, by several orders of magnitude, therefore providing new opportunities to deliver angiogenic drugs and other therapies in brain tumors as well as vessels. I would like to mention that these observations have been recently confirmed by other uh, uh, colleagues in different tumor models and different cell settings, demonstrating that these are uh, demonstrating the robustness and uh, for targeted drug delivery and how this can be explored in, in different settings, and particularly in mediating targeted drug delivery with brain tumor microenvironment. So I would like to mention that we are currently exploring uh, this technology for non-invasive delivery of nucleic acids and oncogene silencing with pediatric tumors. And I would like to know if you are interested in this topic, please attend the presentation by, by my student, Yuton Gue. Yuton Gu, where she will uh, demonstrate and show you how the joint development of microbubble and high focus ultrasound with uh, nanoparticle formulations can lead to profound increases in uh, nucleic acid delivery in brain tumor microenvironment, as well as mediate cancer specific cell death. So, the second approach that I would like to uh, mention is related to the role of focus ultrasound mediated thermal stress uh, for target drug delivery 
and releasing brain tumors. While the role of thermal stress has been extensively um, studied in the context of extracranial malignancies, in the, in the context of intracranial malignancy and brain tumor has not been studied to that extent. And this is primarily because it has been quite challenging to deposit thermal energy for a long time in the brain tumor. So by designing a focus ultrasound system that can safely induce local hyperthermia with focus ultrasound in mice brains, we were able to study the impact of FUS or focus ultrasound mediated thermal stress in brain tumor environment. Interestingly, this work has been, has been performed by, uh, by my students so at a young team. Interestingly, what we observe is that when we apply uh, focus ultrasound hyperthermia for around 10 minutes, uh, and at the temperature level of 141.5 uh, uh, degrees Celsius, we found an acute increase in the vascular permeability in the brain tumor microenvironment, as you can see from this uh, MRI image that demonstrates changes in the kink trans value. This increase also correlated with uh, chemotherapy delivery, with positive correlate positively with chemotherapy delivery in the brain tumor microenvironment. Please take a look at the presentation from uh, my student Yuan Kim. Uh, where he will also show his findings that when this uh, focus ultrasound hyperthermia is combined with thermosensitive uh, nanoparticles, and especially for temperature sensitive liposomal doxorubicin, can lead to, to, to similar drug delivery as though as the one achieved with microbubble enhanced focus ultrasound when combined with free doxorubicin. Therefore, this, uh, the thermal stress we, we believe that provide new opportunities and new approaches to deliver drugs in brain tumors, especially when they combine with thermosensitive In summary, our findings demonstrate that focus ultrasound mediated thermal and mechanical effects provide unique opportunities towards attaining clinically effective drug delivery against brain tumors. And here I provide the different mechanisms upon which focus ultrasound can promote mass transport in brain tumor microenvironment. Our current research is focused towards identifying nanoparticle and drug properties that will lead to maximum drug delivery when combined with focus ultrasound. With that, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ashish Ranjan and I'm a professor of oncology in the College of Veterinary Medicine at Oklahoma State University. In this talk, uh, I'll be discussing approaches that my lab is employing to enhance doxorubicin delivery and a penetration of doxorubicin in solid tumors with focused ultrasound and nanoparticles. The last few decades have seen significant progress in the areas of nanotechnology-based targeted drug delivery systems for solid tumor therapy. In fact, several nanoformulations have already entered clinical trials and some of them are even in clinical use. Despite their improved side effect profiles, uh, the anti-tumor efficacies of nanoparticle drug delivery systems still do not significantly exceed those of conventional chemotherapy. Uh, the precise reasons for this still limited efficacy are unknown, but is likely due to low intratumoral uh, drug release rates and limited penetration depth of the delivery system from blood vessels in a tumor. To overcome this limitation, my lab is investigating the role of hyperthermia uh, in enhancing the nanoparticle drug distribution in a tumor. Mounting evidence suggests that tumor heating increases blood flow, causes vasodilation, uh, reduces the interstitial fluid pressures to increase the permeability of nanoparticles, as well as sensitize cancer cells to chemotherapy. In one study, we combined uh, MR-guided uh, HIFU hyperthermia with uh, low temperature sensitive liposomes or LTSLs uh, to drive the doxorubicin uptake in the rabbit VX2 tumor. Unlike the stealth liposome nanoparticles that part passively accumulates in the tumor through the leaky vasculatures, uh, the LTSLs can release doxorubicin at a temperature just above uh, the body temperature as shown on the right. Our specific experiment uh, compared free doxorubicin, LTSL alone, and LTSL plus HIFU in the rabbit model. 
uh, four hour post treatment, the tumors were harvested and analyzed for uh, doxorubicin delivery. As an example of hyperthermia treatment, uh, we achieved a uniform and consistent uh, mild hyperthermia in the target zone with MR HIFU as shown on the right side. It took us about uh, 20 seconds to achieve the mean target temperature of 40 to 41 degrees C, after which the temperature was consistently kept uh, within the target range utilizing um, the temperature feedback control. Uh, we found that LTSL in combination with MR HIFU achieved an impressive uh, three to seven fold greater DOX delivery than LTSL and DOX alone. Also, in contrast to LTSL alone, that mostly achieved DOX robustin delivery in the tumor periphery with limited intertumoral uh, penetrations. Uh, DOX distribution was seen both in the tumor core and periphery with LTSL plus MR HIFU. Based on this premise, uh, we have started understanding the therapeutic potentials of this approach in pet cats and dogs with spontaneous cancers. Early data suggests that uh, uh, LTSLs and HIFU can enhance toxorubicin delivery and also activate an anti-tumoral immune response in the patients, uh, which is quite interesting. Although the MR HIFU approach is attractive, uh, it can be limited uh, to centralized facilities. Uh, to overcome this, uh, we have also investigated uh, ultrasound guided HIFU, uh, which has the benefits of lower cost, uh, portability, and image acquisition speed. Uh, in a recent study, we developed an ultrasound imageable echogenic LTSLs or eLTSL based drug delivery system. These ELTSL system co-encapsulates an ultrasound contrast agent PFP or perfluoropentane with the DOX payload. Uh, in the murine model, we noted a marked increase uh, in doxorubicin delivery uh, in the mild hyperthermic range uh, with uh, ELTSLs compared to LTSL and doxorubicin alone. Also compared to LTSLs that achieved a more heterogeneous doxorubicin delivery, the PFP encapsulation within the LTSL caused a more homogeneous dox distributions in the tumor periphery and core. In summary, our data suggests that uh, combining nanoparticles with thermally sensitive liposomes can provide a cost effective and a unique capability to specially control the safe delivery and distribution of doxorubicin uh, within tumors in vivo. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tyrone Porter, and I'm a professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. And today I'm going to discuss or share with you on the topic of leveraging sound and stimuli responsive particles for drug delivery. There are a number of uh, aspects or features of focus ultrasound that are very attractive for uh, triggered drug delivery in vivo. This is includes uh, it's an external energy source that can be applied non invasively. Uh, at the focus, the pressure can exceed 10 megapascal, which is on the order of 100 atmospheres, and the temperature can exceed 100 degrees Celsius. It's also non-ionizing, so there's no damage to intervening tissue, and uh, this allows for multiple treatments, multiple exposures, uh, and the ultrasound travels deeper into tissue than light. These features can be leveraged for localized drug delivery in vivo, uh, and ideally, you want uh, particles to be engineered to leverage uh, the ability to, of ultrasound to rapidly change the local pressure and or temperature significantly uh, for drug delivery. Uh, my group, as well as others, have uh, leveraged this uh, strategy uh, to uh, trigger drug release from thermosensitive liposomes where ultrasound was used to heat uh, the local temperature above the melting temperature for the uh, liposomes. And that rapidly releases the encapsulated drug. We've explored this idea uh, using uh, MR thermometry to monitor the ultrasound heating. Um, and as you can see here on the left column, uh, images from the MR scanner, 
Uh, the images were then processed in order to calculate the temperature. And then we monitor, use that information to develop a scheme, a pulsing scheme, uh, in order to heat the tumor to a, a target temperature and then hold it that temperature for an order of five minutes. We then harvested the tumors, sliced the tumors, and then took images of it, the drug distribution inside the tumors um, after heating. Um, we loaded the liposomes with doxorubicin, which quenches while it's inside of the liposomes, and then fluoresces, fluoresces once it's released into the tumor. The top row shows untreated. Um, in this case, there was no drug that was delivered. The second row shows drug release from traditional formulations of thermosensitive liposomes containing doxorubicin that were then heated to 43 degrees for five minutes. There is notable release of drug. And then the bottom row is a, a novel polymer-modified thermosensitive liposome developed in, the lab in our laboratory. Once again, heated to 43 degrees Celsius. The polymer enhances uh, the leakiness of the, of the liposomes. And so there's notably <clears throat> more drug that's been released um, when heated for uh, five minutes at that temperature. So <clears throat> high food and thermosensitive liposomes have been used, um, proven to be effective approach for triggering drug release from thermosensitive liposomes in solid tumors. <clears throat> Clinical trials are underway to test the efficacy of this treatment strategy. And the approach may be employed for local delivery of various therapeutic agents, including small molecule drugs and biologics. The other strategy that we tested um, was for superheated nanodroplets. Uh, and these are perfluorocarbon, uh, liquid perfluorocarbon uh, base, uh, and they vaporize um, when subjected or, uh, to ultrasound pulses uh, above a particular threshold pressure. The resultant bubbles cavitate nonlinearly and in some cases collapse, which permeabilizes biological interfaces, including cell membranes that are in close proximity. We tested this uh, technology um, using, uh, for delivery of small interfering RNA, uh, which has a sequence that is complementary to a target uh, messenger RNA. Messenger RNA uh, codes uh, for a particular protein. We're looking for silencing or reduction in um, the expression of that particular protein after delivery of the small interfering RNA. We tested this idea using siRNA that was uh, engineered or the sequence uh, was programmed for green fluorescent protein. Uh, and deliver it using our perfluorocarbon nanodroplets. Uh, we analyzed the cells after 48 hours after uh, sun operation. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, using facts or flow cytometry, we measured the fluor fluorescence intensity or the change in fluorescence intensity for a subpopulation of cells uh, that were uh, uh, sun operated uh, with uh, the perfluorocarbon droplets and siRNA was delivered. Uh, you notice there is a reduction in the fluorescence intensity for a subpopulation and then confirmed this with uh, a positive control which was siRNA delivered using a commercial transfection agent. And so there is success um, in, in this strategy and other groups are using and leveraging this technology and this strategy for delivery of other small molecules and biologics as well. So cavitation-mediated permeabilization may be used uh, for delivery uh, of a variety of therapeutics across biological interfaces. The delivery is most efficient when therapeutic uh, bubble and bio-interface are in close proximity simultaneously. Uh, there have been a number of creative single particle and particle assemblies to achieve this goal. And then the strategy is most attractive for permeabilizing form formidable interfaces, including blood-brain barrier or delivery of molecules that are active specifically in the cytoplasm. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the group members that participated in this research, this line of research, as well as collaborators and the funding agencies that made the research possible, including the Focus Ultrasound Surgery Foundation. And thank you for your attention. All right, uh, I'd like to start by uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me. It's uh, great to be part of this uh, very interesting uh, panel. Um, and I'd like to tell you about work in our lab that's motivated by the vision of the future of medicine, where we're gonna have small nanoscale or microscale devices that are gonna roam around our bodies and diagnose and treat disease. 
giving us much more uh, precision than can be provided by just drugs or by surgery where you have to cut somebody open. Um, with one modification that perhaps instead of or in addition to devices that are shrunk down to be the size of a cell, that these submarines are going to be based on cells themselves. And that's because if you think about what we want these devices to do, cells already know how to do 90% of that. They can roam around, they can detect signals, we can engineer them uh, using gene circuits to make decisions, and they can carry out um, a variety of functions. And um, of course, we're not alone in thinking about this. There's an entire field of synthetic biology that um, has advanced dramatically in the last decade or so um, with cells being used as diagnostic and therapeutic agents, perhaps um, most prominently with the development of uh, immunotherapy based on uh, engineered uh, T cells, but, but also in the realm of probiotics where bacteria are now being engineered uh, to go into the GI tract or other parts of, of the body um, and do things. And one of the challenges in this field is that once we inject these cells into people, it's kind of a black box. We don't have good ways to tell where are these cells, what are they doing, and we don't have good ways to tell them what to do based on specific locations inside the body. And this is where um, I think ultrasound can really help. Um, and as people in this audience know better than I do, um, ultrasound is a fantastic technique for both deep imaging and for depositing energy or momentum um, into specific locations inside the body. And what we'd like to do is to couple these capabilities to the uh, function of therapeutic and diagnostic cells inside the body. So. Uh, the inspiration for that comes from uh, the well-known uh, theranostic agents of microbubbles, uh, which have had all kinds of impact um, throughout uh, medicine. But of course, these are kind of the size of a cell. So how do you connect them to what cells are doing? So the question that's occupied our lab for the last few years is how can cells themselves make something like this to allow them to communicate with uh, sound waves? And here, nature gave us a gift uh, by evolving these really beautiful protein nanostructures that help photosynthetic bacteria float in bodies of water so they can access the right uh, level of sunlight. Um, and uh, to do that, they form these really beautiful protein nanostructures that self-assemble inside the cell called gas vesicles. This is an electron micrograph of one of them. And what's special about these proteins is that they're hollow on the inside. You have a two nanometer thick protein shell enclosing this 200 nanometer compartment that's just filled with air. Um, and uh, when these cells want to float higher, they turn on the genetic program that creates the proteins and self-assemble into these nanostructures and makes more of them. And what we thought is, okay, well, you, you know, here you have a cell that based on a genetic program can make something that's filled with air. Perhaps it could be used for ultrasound imaging and eventually therapy. And uh, indeed, that turned out to be true. And uh, over the last few years, we've had a blast on the imaging side of things uh, by learning about the mechanics of these structures, engineering them at the level of the genes and proteins, figuring out optimal pulse sequences, uh, turning them into biosensors. I just want to show you one brief example of that before moving on to therapy. Um, one of the biggest challenges we took on was taking this relatively complex genetic program that allows uh, cells to form these structures and move that into mammalian cells. So here we have uh, cancer cell line, HEK, 293 cells um, that uh, now have been genetically engineered to express uh, these gas vesicles. And we can see in the, in the bottom here, this is an image of a, a mouse tumor where this thing in the color scale is uh, gene expression taking place inside that tumor. And we can tell where it's happening with 100 micron precision. So this brings synthetic biology and ultrasound uh, together in the imaging domain. Now, where this moves into therapy and of interest to the uh, Foos Foundation is now we can we can use these uh, innocent little gas vesicles as seeds for inertial cavitation. And this is something that Avinom Barzayan, postdoc in my lab, is very talented, uh, pioneered. And the idea is that we have these intact gas vesicles. If we apply enough pressure, we can cause them to collapse. The air that's inside of them gets instantly liberated into a nanobubble. And normally that bubble would dissolve that within about a millisecond or less. But if you have a more sustained pulse and sufficient pressure, then you can cause this little nanobubble to grow through rarefaction and over several cycles actually gets bigger through rectified diffusion and coalescence of smaller bubbles into larger ones until you can get big enough that you can have inertial cavitation happening that produces a much stronger mechanical effect uh, locally. And, and we've documented that acoustically by seeing these broadband emissions here in orange. This is happening at a frequency and pressure 
peak negative pressure that does not cause uh, uh, bubble formation and cavitation in the absence of these gas vesicles. So it is happening very specifically. We can see it with our own eyes here with uh, cancer cells through which we targeted these proteins uh, through molecular recognition. And initially, this is a 5 million frame per second video. We just see the texture of the cells. But as we start applying ultrasound over time, we start to see the, the formation and cavitation of these black uh, bubbles, um, which now uh, act as disrupting agents that uh, can um, open the membranes of these cells, as we can see here with propidium iodide. Now, even more exciting is to uh, have the cells genetically encode the gas vesicles and turn themselves into the ultrasound trigger therapeutic agent. So depicted here as the cell getting detonated to blow itself up. And what that can do is it can locally disrupt uh, tissue, which may be useful for therapeutic purposes, and to release a payload. And so Avinom engineered this gene cluster where we have the genes encoding gas vesicles plus a payload gene, and as a model, he used the luminescent protein, which gets released with the application of focused ultrasound. And we can see that because we uh, uh, um, kill a subset of these cells um, and we release their contents, which we can quantify here. So, you know, obviously in five minutes, uh, can provide Huge amount of detail. We have a lot of it published in BioArchive and some other things that are not yet published. But the core idea is that this is now allowing us to have a genetically encoded um, uh, seed for uh, cavitation, which opens up a whole bunch of different possibilities. So the main takeaways um, I hope uh, you'll take away, and I'm happy to discuss in the discussion, is that synthetic biology is a new tool for both research and medicine. And uh, I think it presents a big opportunity uh, and, frankly, need uh, for ultrasound approaches to interact with these cells. And it is just becoming possible to couple focused ultrasound to cells using genetic tools. And there are many exciting challenges and opportunities. And these are the folks in my lab um, who are uh, pursuing them. Thank you very much. And I look forward to our discussion. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this drug delivery panel discussion. I'm Christy Holland, and I'd like to welcome you all to this session. I might give you a quick pointer. Um, I learned on the Show Care platform that if you type your question into the chat line, the session chair does not read it, does not see it. However, if you submit it as a new question, they will. So please use that upper feature uh, of the Show Care platform in order to um, type in your questions. Um, so, um, so we have a question already that's come in, and I think instead of take, asking my questions, I'm going to go ahead with the audience that's out there. Costas, for you, in your transcranial mild hyperthermia experiments, which only lasted 10 minutes, did you observe skull heating, associated damage, confirmed by um, MRI or HE? Yes, that's, uh, that's a very great question. In fact, that's the major uh, challenge for doing this, uh, this treatment in the brain. So when we started the experiment, we just said, let's use one megahertz transducers and we just try to, to do hyperthermia. And we quite, quite quickly, we realized that the skull is, is heating a lot. So we, then we just uh, develop mathematical modeling and we simulate the entire process in search for identifying optimum uh, transducer properties of frequency regimens. Essentially, the problem is in the mice that in the low frequencies, you have high penetration from the skull. However, at the same time, the focal region becomes extremely large. Therefore, high intensity is overlapped with the skull. So that was kind of like the mistake from our first kind of one megahertz frequency decision. However, if you go to high frequencies, then high reflections are taking place. Therefore, you don't have enough energy going through the skull. And so therefore, you always have to keep increasing the intensity if you hit the skull. We found that the sweet spot is around 1.6 megahertz for experiments in mice, and that gave the best kind of penetration with respect to a uh, skull heating. It's far from perfect, but we were able to have uh, uh, to apply hyperthermia for 10 minutes at 41.5 degrees Celsius without having any major uh, tissue damage with respect to HME analysis. Yes, when we were able to see very good penetration for that. So I, I'll ask you a follow-up question too. So, you know, the hyperthermia causes vasodilation. And the question is, is, is the vascular leaking? You know, do the endothelial cells as you vasodilate come further apart or not? What, and where do you think the bubble activity is important? Intravascular or interstitial out? Like where do you think spatially, where is the bubble activity important? Yeah, that's, that's a, I would say that's the two excellent questions. Uh, the first question, I don't know if it's vasodilation is related to thermal effects or mechanical effects. But if it's related to thermal effects, uh, we just have done like an extended research with uh, measuring K-trans, and K-trans is an MRI 
technique that uh, is a proxy to perfusion, but also incorporates to some extent changes in the uh, in the permeability. So those two effects might play a role, and perfusion increasing perfusion might increase the, num- the amount of drug, increasing the permeability might increase the amount of drug that is going through the vessel into the tissue. So, so that's one aspect, and we don't know exactly where what happens, but both are they seem to correlate very well with improved drug delivery. So with respect to mechanical effects and cavitation activity, we we kind of like take a, an approach that, you know, while we're extreme leaders in the biophysics and the interactions of microbubble dynamics with, with tissue, we also consider the drug properties. So where the drug is taking place, I think we, we, we do believe that it highly depends on the properties of the drug. And also, of course, with a target. If you are targeting the vasculature, then having microbubble activity in the vessels is going to be the ideal scenario. So you get able to increase the permeability. And in fact, you don't have to worry that much about the transcellular properties of the drugs. However, if you're interested in delivering drugs into the tissue, which is most of the applications are, where in the brain, especially for neurodegenerative disease as well as cancer, we do believe that, you know, having bubbles in the interstitial space is becoming extremely challenging, especially in the brain that is well, very well documented that the poor uh, the porosity, the pore size in the brain, at least in mice that you know has done extensive risk, has been done extensive research, is of the order of 60 nanometers. So we do think that you know th- things that are molecules and particles that are larger than 60 nanometers will not have the chance to go deep. So in that respect, we really want to the micro bubbles to open the gates or the, the barriers imposed to the drug delivery by the endothelial wall. And in the brain, we know that endothelial layer is extremely complex and, and responsible for regulating transport and it's called like as a blood-brain barrier. Interestingly, what we did find was that when we apply microbubbles in the brain vasculature, we have an increase in the interstitial transport. This provides unique opportunities for using, for taking the best of two worlds. The, the world of, of focus ultrasound drug delivery, which has been well and extensively documented to be able to increase the, the, the extravasation and the, the world of nanomedicine a nanoparticle formulation that has done extensive research in developing formulation and properties that have unique uh, cellular uptake properties. And that's what we are we're heading right now, trying to combine those two worlds in order to attain uh, the best in terms of high uptake and also selective uptake by targeted cells. Thanks, Costas. So I think we're going to move to Ashish. I see a question for you here. Um, how do you control the temperature using your echogenic low temperature uh, sensitive uh, liposomes? So that's the first question. And uh, was the hypothermia region covering the whole VX2 tumor? So for the echogenic liposome study, those studies were done in a mice model and uh, we utilized an ultrasound guided system. So obviously we didn't have a real time thermometry while we were doing the treatment, uh, but before Initiating the project, we optimized the hyperthermia condition using a set of parameters, and we utilized the same parameters in all the mice, uh, assuming that the temperature uh, at the site of heating is around 40 to 43 degrees C. Um, So that's how we did for the ultrasound guided study. Uh, For the VX2 rabbit study, we use MR HIFU using the Philips Sonolive system, and we utilize MR thermometry. Uh, to estimate the temperatures uh, in the target region. And we only heated a part of the tumor, uh, not the entire tumor. Um, So the data that you saw was uh, based on partial tumor heating uh, of those tumors. Thanks for clarifying. So have you measured the circulation time of your echogenic liposomes? Were they, I don't know if they're pegylated. How long do you expect them to last in the circulation? The pharmacokinetics is similar to LTSL. What we don't know is uh, whether the bubbles are retained for that amount of time in circulation. Uh, We did heat for 60 minutes and we did the heating in a sequential manner. Uh, uh, We call that a zonal hyperthermia. And what we noted was when we compared the drug delivery from the ELTSL uh, relative to the LTSLs, uh, there was a consistent increase uh, in the drug delivery in those regions, suggesting that the bubbles uh, might have been retained uh, to some extent over the one hour period uh, inside the liposomes. Okay, that's very interesting. 
Um, so I, I also found your mention of an immune response uh, very interesting in terms of almost justification for not treating the whole tumor. Um, other investigators have, have seen this too, where instead of trying to essentially ablate or kill or deliver drugs to the entire tumor to do it partially, in order to also allow uh, the body essentially um, to fight uh, the, the cancer using, you know, immune response. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, this is kind of a switch we also have made as a research group where now we are not only focusing on the drug delivery, but how are the immune system, uh, anti-tumor immune system getting impacted by the bubble treatments and uh, Unlike micro bubbles, the nano bubbles uh, don't behave the same in an ultrasound field, and uh, we feel that it, they don't really generate cavitation-like effect, but more cell stress, mild cell stress uh, that can translate into an immunogenic cell death, uh, which is characterized by the release of damage-associated molecular patterns, uh, such, uh, translocation of intracellular proteins all of which uh, aids in a systemic anti-tumor response. Uh, so uh, we did a study with LTSL Thermodox uh, that is being uh, manufactured by Celsius Corporation in combination with thermosensitive light bulbs, uh, in combination with HIFO. And what we learned was when you treat local, there's a systemic anti-tumor effect that comes out of it. And we are seeing something similar with the bubble liposomes too, a little bit more than what you would see with LTSL, suggesting that the bubbles uh, somehow increase the cell stress on the tumor uh, microenvironment that in turn reflects in a better immune response. Fascinating. Tyrone, let's move to you. So, um, you know, I, I really was fascinated by your droplets that convert the phase change into microbubbles. Um, and that carry a drug along with it. Have you measured drug release from that particle? No, we, um, the work that I, uh, we've done and, and published, we did not have siRNA directly coupled Got it. Uh, to the droplets. Um, we tried to do that. I had a student that did make efforts at doing that, had some success, um, and we kind of tabled it for a number of years just to focus on um, studying the efficiency. And my student was much more interested in the physics, uh, the bubble dynamics, and how you could actually leverage the bubble dynamics and control the bubble activity in order to optimize delivery. There's been some other groups. I know Rod is on the call, and, and, and he's done some work where he's uh, doing the untaging. Uh, and um, uh, there's a professor at... Uh, um, MIT and uh, ET, uh, he's in uh, Switzerland and has also done some work in this area. So, um, you know, there's other people who have been studying this, um, and I would highly recommend people take a look at their, their publications. So something that Kevin Hayworth has noticed, too, is when you get these phase changes from a droplet into a gas bubble, uh, you can very efficiently degas uh, the solution around that bubble. Uh, so that's another physics kind of thing too, right? Thermodynamics, where you get this huge volumetric increase, which then is devoid of uh, gas in the bubble that's just been pulled open. And so gas very rapidly actually diffuses into that bubble from the surrounding fluid. And you can get, you know, on the order of 20% saturation. And we think we could even pull oxygen off hemoglobin. So have you measured any of that? Or do you think it could be used for advantage particularly to kill or would that be a problem like is that a good thing or is that a bad thing it, it could be a it could be a good thing if you um you know if you really have a good sense of the extent that you're able to scavenge oxygen um i know of kevin's work uh kevin hayworth's um and really creative scientists I think it could be useful in particular for um, treating cancer, right? So you could potentially deoxygenate the blood and starve the tumors, the cancer cells. So you could potentially get an ischemic response. Um, it's an interesting question because there is there has been some publications from a group at UPenn on antivascular therapies, you know, uh, using ultrasound for that purpose. And so you could purposefully promote ischemia locally. Um, and I think that would be 
you know, really interesting is to sort of look deeper at. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. And Michael, I've got a question for you too. So, you know, of course I noticed that you were using 670 kilohertz, which is getting down into a regime that I'm very interested in for transcranial applications. So why exactly did you choose that frequency? It's a very specific 670 kilohertz frequency. Sure, yeah, and I, I want to credit uh, the discussion we had in the green room just now with my venerable colleagues um, about frequencies that's uh, going to inform this answer. So uh, I guess there, there are two, two answers. One is um, that here we're using the gas vesicles as nucleators of bubble formation, and um, that tends to be more efficient when you're using lower frequencies because it facilitates uh, processes like um, uh, bubble coalescence and potentially rectified uh, diffusion, and so we found empirically, in the in the context of using gas vesicles, the uh, frequency below one megahertz tends to be more effective. And this actually is a fortuitous thing for us because we're trying to use gas vesicles as both therapeutics and diagnostics that we want to image. And we found that we're use, when we're using imaging pulses, um, and the actually the amplitudes are pretty close to each other. But when we're using imaging pulses that are three uh, megahertz or higher, we don't get any of this kind of cavitation. Uh, behavior. Uh, and so that really allows the gas vesicles to serve as the theranostics in the sense that we can image them, and then we can turn to a lower frequency and uh, longer pulse duration to um, activate them. And then, of course, it is it is very useful to um, operate at a frequency that is conducive to op, you know being used in the brain, uh, in addition to other places in the body. Yeah, I really like your synthetic biology approach to the creation of these particles. And I'm wondering if you're also uh, using a more biological approach to see the cellular re response to the bubble activity. So one thing, of course, in a five-minute talk, you can't include anything, but I was interested to see if there was any kind of calcium wave that emanates from the initially mm -hmm. damaged cell or, or or what other things do you have planned in order to uh, study the biological response? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so far we've done um, kind of relatively standard things for the field in terms of monitoring the response to cavitation. We've been using optical microscopy to see what's going on. So um, what, in terms of the therapeutic effects we're trying to go for, there are three, three types. So one is where we have the gas vesicles as a purified particle that is targeted to a cell, for example, to a cancer cell using surface markers. And in that case, we watch that cancer cell being sonoporated with propidium iodide uh, coming into the cell. In the second mode, we have a cell that's genetically engineered to express the gas vesicles itself that's becoming, you know, a suicide agent, essentially, that we're triggering with ultrasound to blow up and release its content. And in that case, we're using live dead assays to look at viability um, decrease and <clears throat> look at the release of uh, an intracellular payload. And then the third mode is to use either the purified gas vesicles or the cells as a way to disrupt tissue uh, and in that case, in, in vivo now, uh, we're, we're using um, histology to look at the, the effects of the disruption. Of course, there's much more we can investigate um, using these kind of techniques. And then to your, to your other point about whether we could someday do that with ultrasound using a synthetic biology approach, uh, we, of course, are engineering cells also to act as diagnostic agents, where we want cells to infiltrate a tissue, survey what's going on, and then turn on the expression of gas vesicles uh, as a diagnostic marker uh, or modulate their acoustic output um, as a way to monitor um, the molecular signals that are happening in that environment. Yeah, that's really a fascinating um, approach to molecular imaging, uh, to use the cells and to engineer cells to do, to essentially attack or go or attach to certain uh, disease, diseased cells so that you can highlight pathology. I think it's a really interesting approach. So Thank since you. we have a neurovascular surgeon in our midst, I would be remiss if I didn't include you, Yashar. Tell me, I mean, I don't know much about your work, so can you tell me what you're interested in in terms of delivering mitochondria versus drugs? And tell me a little bit about uh, your work in focused ultrasound. Sure, thank you. I, so as a, as a start, I have very little background in focused ultrasound. I should start by saying that uh, I'm a stem cell biologist by training, and uh, my interest has been in regeneration, and uh, especially after injury, especially uh, after ischemic injury to the brain, so a stroke. And, you know, there have been a lot of trials, uh, most of which have uh, shown that there's a little neuroprotective effect in when uh, really assessed in a randomized controlled fashion for uh, for human disease. And the only uh, bona fide treatment that we have for stroke other than giving clot-busting agent TPA is to mechanically open up blood vessels and to restore flow to the brain. 
Um, you know, one of the mechanisms that's known to be interrupted uh, during this process is uh, involves mitochondria as the uh, you know energy uh, powerhouse of the cell, and that this regulation of mitochondria in the penumbra is thought to uh, you know uh, further uh, lead to injury after the initial ischemic insult. So. Uh, there's been accumulating literature that mitochondria are probably involved and that the mitochondria are likely stunned in the setting of stroke, especially in the penumbra. Um, so the interest I had was to see whether delivery of exogenous mitochondria, purified exogenous mitochondria can help rescue cells in the penumbra. And uh, that's when uh, I got interested in using focus ultrasound because we know that the blood-brain barrier is inherently disrupted in the setting of stroke, some areas more than others. But the thought was, can you use focus ultrasound to expand that blood-brain barrier disruption to further enhance delivery of mitochondria, in this case, that are delivered intra-arterially? You so might also be interested in some of my work with Sinon, which is a neuroprotectant, and it blocks the NMDA receptors in order to oh. prevent that apoptosis that occurs in the penumbra. Very cool. Uh, so, yeah, it's a similar kind of idea where you're focused on those cells that are in the penumbra that are in that transition zone. Sure. Uh, it, not unlike the heart, too, after a heart attack, if you're ischemic, then you take up too much oxygen and get kicked into apoptosis. So something you could do to block, you know, that that progression in order to cell death, particularly in that transition zone, I think is a really great approach. Right. And that, that was exactly the thought. The thought was, can can we use a clinically relevant model? So the model we use, there's a transient middle cerebral artery occlusion where you know, there's a clot in the middle cerebral artery. And as I do clinically, you remove the clot and then place a catheter into the middle cerebral artery of the mouse and deliver the agent of interest exactly where you want it to go. And then sure. hope that focus ultrasound can enhance that uh, propagation uh, propagation effect. And then Rog, tell me about your work. I know that you you were to have given a talk and I have I don't know your work. Please tell me about it. And you're muted, so you're gonna have to unmute. And thank you for that reminder. Sure. Um, so, uh, so we uh, are really focused on um, the development of uh, these drug-carrying uh, nano emulsions that we've made, the uh, perfluorocarbon nano emulsions that we originally thought were phase change nano emulsions. Um, and in the process of stabilizing them to be able to uh, persist in vivo, um, we seem to have lost the phase change. So they're just, they seem to be ultrasound sensitive and uh, release their drug cargo um, locally uh, with the application of ultrasound and uh, trying to develop this technique for targeted drug delivery. Um, have a, a good amount of proof of concept data in rats now. And so now we're really focused on uh, the clinical translation of the system. So what's the mechanism of release of the drug from the droplet? It's a, it's a very good uh, question that uh, we're collaborating with Kathy Ferraro. Uh, and trying to um, figure out, uh, we're doing some of the high-speed optical imaging that um, y'all uh, we, we we were talking about in the green room. Um, and so far, what we've seen is that you know we don't have so much evidence of an actual phase change, so we don't see any mic or uh, uh, micron level uh, uh, bubble formation or anything like that. Um, we don't see any real acoustic backscatter. Um, so our best model, which is kind of a model of exclusion by exclusion, is that the, uh, there's an, a mechanical interaction of some sort of mechanical mode of say oscillation or deformation under the ultrasound field. Um, that induces porosity in the encapsulating layer, the emulsifying layer, which was where we believe our drug is. And then that porosity allows the drug to then see the medium to then get out to get into the, um, to, to the medium to act as it otherwise normally would. So uh, yeah, well, I, 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 if we had, if anyone had ideas for how to look at this dynamic process on a nano scale, um, you know, in you know, some real time or something like that, you know, uh, please, yeah, I would, I would love to, to learn more. Um, and uh, we are doing some uh, uh, optical scattering experiments and laser experiments, but I mean, you know, that's very preliminary and was completely scuttled by COVID. So, uh, but we're getting those going now too. But at least for now, we're relying on the phenomenology. And so far, things look good for our clinical translation. But that's, you know, the, the real bear of a task that we're kind of uh, trying to get going. Though I think we are on task to be in humans within a couple of years. I wonder if you're just getting mixing. And I'm wondering if you're also getting cavitation that's not nucleated by the droplets. It's happening next to the droplets that then just aids in terms of uh, mm -hmm. convection. Uh, yeah, um, we... Um, I guess we haven't 
fully, fully degas. And I guess like the moment that you take it out of the gas or it could, you know, the medium could regas pretty quickly for the size of the volumes that we've tested in vitro. Um, certainly in vivo, uh, uh, we'll have dissolved gases there that, you know, can, can aid the, you know, uh, um, diffusion or, or whatnot that, uh, well, that you might mention. We are unfortunately at the end of our time allotted. I really have enjoyed this conversation with you all today and I wish you well in the rest of your day. Have a wonderful one. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.